Good afternoon, and thank you to everyone for joining us for the latest installment of TCU Presents. Today's discussion will celebrate the influential role of women in the arts. Uh, women have participated in the visual arts in many ways throughout the centuries, as patrons, as tastemakers, as muses and models, but our focus today is women artists. From Leonardo da Vinci to Dali, the best known artists in the Western world have long belonged to a mostly male club. Uh, Mary Cassatt, a notable exception from the late 19th century, was given a boost by her male contemporary, Edgar Degas. Even George O'Keefe, who rose to fame in the 1920s, only gained recognition after photographer Alfred Stieglitz exhibited some of her work without her permission. However, we're increasingly becoming aware that many women have practiced as artists for centuries, broad name recognition aside. Uh, today, we will remember women stretching back to the 1500s who forged a living in male-dominated European art world in spite of the fact that they were often denied entry into the requisite art schools where they could study the live model or show their work in important exhibitions or get the best commissions. Uh, we'll go on to discuss the women who continue to push boundaries by producing unforgettable art today. Uh, this panel is brought to you by the TCU Alumni Association, by TCU Magazine, and the Office of Social Media Management. I'm Nancy Edwards, Curator of European Art and Head of Academic Services at the Kimball Art Museum. Uh, my area of specialization is Italian Renaissance art, but I have a wide range of art historical interests. Before joining the Kimball, I taught at TCU and the University of Dallas. Uh, this year, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Kimball. And in the context of today's topic, I'd like to mention that one of the Kimball's most cherished works, a self-portrait by the French artist Elisabeth uh, Vigée Lebrun, was a, famous, uh, was a favorite artist of Kay Kimball, the founder of the museum, one of the founders. Uh, and indeed, the Kimball organized the first exhibition that was devoted to the artist in 1982. It was only decades later, in 2015-2016, that the Louvre, the Met, and the National Gallery of Canada organized a retrospective of her work. Uh, and the, indeed, the, the story of uh, Vigée Le Brun is a common one. Uh, there are a number of women artists from the Renaissance, two contemporary artists, who only recently have begun to be recognized with, uh, ex with retrospective exhibitions or one-woman exhibitions. Uh, however, it should be acknowledged that there were fewer female practicing painters during the early modern period than there were male artists. We'll talk about some of the obstacles that female artists faced in the program and what changes we find now in the contemporary art world. Um, I'd also like to invite you to come to the Kimball to see our latest acquisition. It's a stunning still life with a bowl of strawberries, a basket of cherries, and a branch of gooseberries by the French artist, Louise Moyon. Uh, it was painted in 1631. And more about this wonderful artist later in the program. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce to you today's panelists, both of whom are familiar to the TCU community and to the wider world of visual arts. Babette Bone has recently retired from TCU and is now Professor Emerita of Art History. Her expertise is in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art. She has written nine books, the most recent of which, Women Artists, Their Patrons, and Their Publics in Early Modern Bologna, was published in March uh, 2021. Last November, she delivered the prestigious 25th annual Sidney J. Freeberg Lecture 
on Italian art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Babette has devoted decades to shining a spotlight on female artists, uh, such as the 16th century Italian painter Lavinia Fontana and on Elisabetta Sirani, who lived and worked in the 17th century. Those women and the 66 others Babette profiled in her latest book have not enjoyed the high profile of, say, Giorgio O'Keefe or of, uh, Frida Kahlo, but they're certainly beginning to receive more interest from private collectors, museums, and the public at large. Babette, welcome. Thank you, Nancy. I'm happy to be here. And um, also joining us is Andrea Carnes, Chief Curator at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, a former student of Babette, Andrea received her master's degree in art history from TCU in 2001. She joined the museum as a receptionist in 1891 and rose through the ranks to her current role as chief curator. Along the way, she has served as curator for over 40 exhibitions, very many of them focusing on female artists. In 2016, Cause, Where the End Starts, smashed the museum's attendance records. The most recent exhibition that she's curated, Women Painting Women, which closed in September, featured the works of 46 female artists. The show included women of color like Micheline Thomas, Arpita Singh, and Amy Sher Sherald, who is best known for painting the official White House portrait of former First Lady Michelle Obama. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Nancy. And welcome to everyone who is um, watching us online. Please drop any questions that you have in the chat and we'll try to answer them live later in the program. Well, it's um, fair to say the art world landscape is growing to become more uh, inclusive uh, slowly, but it is changing. We can look back a half century ago uh, to the 1971 feminist essay by Linda Nochlin. It was titled, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? as helping to spur this shift. Andrea, would you um, please talk to us about the impact of that essay and how it shaped your exhibition, Women Painting uh, Women at the Modern? Sure. Thank you, Nancy. I read a blurb in 2019 just reminding everyone that Linda Nochlin's essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, was turning 50 in 2021. So... That was really the impetus for me wanting to uh, create a show about women artists, sort of taking the temperature on how things have changed in the last 50 years. The show was planned to open in 2021, but because the, on the 50 year anniversary, but because of COVID, we didn't open my show until 2022. But I think Linda Nochlin's essay, when it was initially written, um, kind of exposed something that most of us in art history, if we were studying women uh, artists, already knew, which is that women were largely left out of the canon of art. And in fact, the canon is much about white Western men um, because painting was a privileged medium, mainly for white men. So I was just trying to take a look in my exhibition at what women have done over the last 50 years. And what I discovered was there have been some steps backwards in terms of women's rights and women's bodies, but there have been some steps forward in terms of inclusivity. The thing I noticed when rereading the Nochlin essay was that it really didn't address sexuality too much. It was mostly just about gender and it didn't really address women of color too much. So we have made progress because now we're inclusive of femme identifying people when we talk about women artists and we're inclusive of people of color uh, when we talk about women artists. So there have been some great shifts, but still there is progress to be made. 
in the in that question, Linda Nakla noted, uh, uh, rather in her her essay, that the very question "Why have there been no great women artists?" reveals a certain implicit bias, mm -hmm. uh, as if you know women were somehow incapable of. Six, uh, achieving success and how that very notion of genius, a word that's traditionally applied to, to male artists uh, only, it's really something perhaps of distortion or a myth that's embraced by the popular uh, imagination. And, and on that note, how would you say we define a great artist or a great female artist? Is that something that we should do? Well, I think Nochlin argues that that notion of greatness is a construct based on who could enter the academies, white men, you know, based on basically accessibility and kind of a systemic way that things have been done. So she, the notion of greatness became normalized to mean white male artist. So I think she's just exposing the fact that this is, is a construct, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't know um, what measures greatness exactly. I mean, certainly fundamental things like understanding a medium, um, you know, pushing the boundaries of a medium or a subject, all these things, of course, come into play now. Um, but maybe I don't know. Babs may have a different uh, view of, of that notion of greatness, or you may, Nancy. But I, I think for me in the contemporary realm, the doors are wide open. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a nice response. Yeah. Babette, Babette, we know so much less about um, women artists um, uh, from the early modern period, that is, you know, from the Renaissance and Baroque periods into the 18th century. Um, first, could you talk a bit about why there were fewer female artists than males, um, painters and sculptors at any rate, and the obstacles that they faced during that time? Sure. It's a good question, Nancy. And I think um, for starters, and actually Nachlin addressed some of these issues all the way back in 1971 when she wrote her essay that you and Andrea were just discussing. When you were training to be a painter, or if you wanted to be a painter or a sculptor or any kind of artist uh, in the 16th century, say, you had to enter into a professional system that enabled you to receive artistic training that um, authorized you to practice as a professional in the city. You had to be a member of the guild or some other professional organization. And women were not members. They couldn't do apprenticeships, which required uh, women to live in the home of the uh, presumably male artists. That wouldn't have been socially acceptable. So at least most of the women, not all, but most of the women that we first heard about were actually the daughters of painters. But I think as time has gone on and we've learned more about women artists, first of all, we found out that there were a lot more of them than we used to think. I mean, when I first uh, discovered that there were 68 women artists in early modern Bologna. And I would tell that to people, nobody could believe there were actually that many. So I think part of the answer is there are a lot more than we used to think, but they may not have matriculated through public organizations and things that would have made us more aware of them. Uh, so that's really an issue. And I think one of the most exciting uh, discoveries that I made in my book was realizing that in Bologna, in any case, most women were not trained by a family member. Most of them actually studied with men who were not relatives. And what that means is there are a whole host of possible uh, permutations about how women were able to become artists that we haven't really uh, 
gone very far in coming to terms with. So I think we need to rethink a lot of our uh, presuppositions about that. So working on women artists is, a, in my period, is pretty exciting because there's so much that we don't know, which means there's so much to discover uh, and realize for the first time. So for me, it's been a really exciting uh, field to work in for uh, the last number of years. I'll, I'll um, add, on, add on to that. Uh, just a few thoughts about our, our new painting by Louise Mouillon on, on, those, on those lines, because uh, she's been recognized as uh, one of the best still life painters in, in, in France. I mean, still life was a relatively new genre. Uh, uh, they were looking to the north to Dutch and Flemish uh, artists, but um, she probably would not have been known had she not signed her paintings. And then uh, when I was exploring her, I found much of what you would find. Um, especially online and in books was, was in fact not quite right. Um, and it took me a lot of work to um, look at the documents and so on to sort it all out. But at the same time, her story is absolutely fascinating. Uh, she stopped painting at age 30 and, you know, what were the reasons? I have some, some theories, but she did come from an artistic um, family uh, in, in this case. Right. Um, with with these uh, women artists, the period that we're talking about, is there there anything that women women artists in the twenty first century can can learn from them about that? Well, as illustrated by your example, if you want to be remembered in the future, sign your works. <laughs> <laughs> not be a bad idea. And some of the artists I work on, such as Lavinia Fontana, the 16th century artist whose painting is my virtual background here, um, signed about half of her paintings. And, you know, the upshot is we have a lot more paintings by Lavinia Fontana that can be securely identified than is true uh, for most artists. But if I could circle back around, I mean, it's a somewhat different set of circumstances for the work that I do. I mean, Andrea can pick up the phone and talk to uh, her artists and interview them. I'm always going to be envious of that, uh, Andrea. If <laughs> There's some burning questions that I'll probably never know the answers to since I don't have that alternative. But what it means is that in my work, I'm much more reliant on uh, archival research and documents. Uh, do any letters survive? Usually not, but sometimes. Uh, and also early biographies. And I, I do think it's important to mention those because one big advantage that I have in working on Bologna is that beginning, uh, at, particularly in the 17th century, um, the male writers of Bologna, and there were lots of them, decided that they really had a significant leg up as an art center because there were so many great women artists. And so they wrote biographies of them. And I think it's such a huge disadvantage. Most women artists of the 16th, 17th, and even 18th centuries that we have little biographical information that's firsthand. And if you think about it, how do I know a painting like the one behind me uh, is by Lavinia Fontana? Well, if I'm really lucky, it's signed. If I'm even luckier, it might be signed and dated and maybe even documented or discussed in a letter or better yet, uh, considered by an early biographer. But if none of those uh, kinds of uh, traceable sources, verifiable sources is available to me, uh, then how would I know uh, who painted this uh, picture? I mean, mm -hmm. so I think there's some different challenges, but I would hope uh, circling back around to your question, that I haven't entirely forgotten, um, I, I think if I were a woman artist today, I would be inspired 
uh, to know that women artists lived in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, that against all the odds, all the professional obstacles uh, and uh, biographical uh, challenges that they faced, that still so many of them managed uh, to achieve what they did. And, you know, Louise Moyon uh, was a still life painter. And I think one of our assumptions about 17th century women artists is that, and 16th century is that they were principally portraitists or still life painters. But uh, it turns out many of them produced narrative paintings or public pictures like altar pieces, as Lavinia Fontana did. She was probably the first, uh, what we might call really professional woman artist who operated as a, a professional male artist would, painting works on commission, producing altar pieces for churches, uh, and actually earning a living that supported her entire family. She had 11 children, so, uh, and her, uh, she contributed to uh, her father's workshop as well. So, I mean, I think to me, if I were a woman artist today, I would be inspired uh, by examples like hers. And if you are, by the way, uh, there will be uh, the first monographic exhibition on Lavinia Fontana in, um, well, it's about, it'll be about 30 years almost, uh, opening in Dublin uh, this summer. So check out the National Gallery of Ireland at Dublin for uh, what promises to be a really exciting exhibition on Lavinia Fontana. Well, let's let's talk now a bit about diversity uh, and inclusion in art uh, made by women today. Uh, Andrea, women painting women, you created a show that intentionally highlighted women. Um, are you seeing more exhibitions like this organized by your peers um, in this country and around the globe? I think so, yes. Um, just a couple of months before my show opened here, the Foundation Beiler in Switzerland opened an exhibition called Close Up that looked at five women artists across centuries. And um, there's been, there, there have been some focus, there have been some people who have focused on the Ninth Street artists, which are basically the wives and girlfriends and other painters that surrounded the abstract expressionists, but the women um, who were largely ignored for many years. And so, yes, there are exhibitions happening um, that, that look at women artists in a kind of revisionist uh, way when it comes to the, the you know, recent times. There's still a struggle. And museums largely, modern and contemporary museums still largely hold white men, um, you know, compared to how many women and how many artists of color. And that's common across museums across the US for sure. So, you know, it's not completely, we're not completely where we need to be, I think. But yes, there's definitely more attention on women artists now. There, there have been early modern shows recently, and I know more that have been planned. There was one at, um, uh, in Detroit in the Wattsworth uh, Athenaeum called By Her Hand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that case, it was calling attention to, to some artists about whom, uh, you know, we're beginning to know, know a bit more. I mean, Andrew, you mentioned the number of holdings, and I, I read an uh, a little piece just this in, in museums of female artists um, th that very often museums, it's not just what they can acquire, but what they are given and by their donors. And so that's something else important to consider that, that uh, people are collecting um, women artists uh, as, as well. Um, the yeah. market still on just to that point, Nancy. The market mm -hmm. is still lower for women artists than it is for male artists, and yeah. so, you know, yes, people are focused in that area, and 
the more institutions collect women artists, the more that market correction will happen. So we, we have a responsibility within the institution, of course, as well, um, to, to help that shift. Mm -hmm. And, and th throughout, when we're, we're talking about this, uh, this, this issue, I've become aware in my own work and, and as I've been investigating way on and so on, uh, how crucial the market is mm -hmm. to the profession. And there's much very interesting work being, being done to, uh, to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. um, Babette mentioned uh, requirements to join the guild and, and, uh, and, and there were changes that certainly happened in, in France where uh, people were trying to hold, hold power and exclude others. Um, that time it became more important to do historical figurative painting. They tried to push down portraitists and still lives, which had an impact on some of the work that women um, were doing during that time. So the Voyant stopped painting around age 30, we think. We don't know why. Um, uh, you often hear it was because she, um, she did marry, and that seems to be a factor. Um, and often it will be said and had children and they'll even name them, but that's wrong. <laughs> uh, taking a cue from Babette, I, you know, there, there is a will and, and she had no children. I mean, if she did, they predeceased her. Um, but, but the, the, the market is, Babette. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I said, look at Lavinia Fontana who had 11 children. I mean, she must have been a healthy, strong person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and those stories right. are so inspiring. It didn't need to 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 uh, stop an artist. So uh, often, I think the market, and it may have been in her case, uh, you know, it was around that 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 time that she possibly would have been forced to to uh, join the guild. Um, and, Andrea, uh, back to you. And in, in what ways do the artwork? So that you selected differ from paintings that are created um, by men. Uh, I mean, in your view, do women paint in slightly different ways? Um, what would you like to 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 say about about that? I think you know the question has tried to been answered. Is there a female gaze? Like this is a question that comes up on any contemporary feminist exhibition. I wasn't really trying to answer that question so much. Although I think there's an argument for a female gaze or a first person gaze. And you could see that in works um, that were in the exhibition, works by Joan Simmel, where she's looking down at her own body and using it um, as subject matter, or Lucita Hurtado, same thing, looking at her own body and relating it to the peaks and valleys of a landscape. But um, I would say the main difference I discovered, and I tried to be really open um, and objective about that question, um, and I didn't make an argument for that in my catalog, but I think the main difference is that men often show a sexualized version of women in their paintings. Um, whereas women are, you know, very bravely look at many different aspects of womanhood um, from completely abject to also uh, using that language of sexualization um, to smash or work, you know, work with or within the kind of stereotype, the kind of archetype of a sexy woman. And, you know, so there's basically, and then some heroicized women, it doesn't always make the most beautiful portrait. So I think women today um, l look at all aspects of womanhood in a way that a man cannot or has not or both. Um, so there, there was that, which I thought was very interesting. And definitely a lot of the women artists in the exhibition are in dialogue with both male and female painters who came before them. So that's why I say some are working within that language that male artists have used to portray women. 
um, but to do something different with it, to kind of turn it on its head in a way, to make us think about how women have been presented to us, what's been normalized. Um, certainly in that exhibition, which was so exciting because of its diversity, there were it, it just so, uh, so many different approaches. Um, uh, I think what sort of held it all together is how exciting they all were in so many different 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 ways. Um, and, and that um, seeing that freedom of expression, I think, mm -hmm. was exciting to see them all together in that way. Um, but for both of you, are, are there other principal challenges that face women, uh, either artists of the past or challenges that they face today that you'd like to address? And I'll, I'll turn it to you first, first Babette. Um, we've, we've mentioned a few things. Right, right. You know, um, I'll just um, circle back and say first, what a wonderful exhibition Andrea's Women Painting Women was, and it was so thought provoking. I think for anyone with an interest in women artists really in, in the field, it really um, gave me a lot of food for thought. And Andrea's comment about the issue of sexuality and how that maybe arguably is treated differently by male and female artists, I think is a really interesting um, point. And, you know, I would say there are women artists in my field, including Lavinia Fontana, who paint erotic pictures. Uh, it's actually been one of the most shocking discoveries about Fontana recently that suddenly a half dozen uh, mostly mythological paintings showing women having sex with men or, you know, doing uh, erotic things uh, with men. And it was honestly hard for me to wrap my mind around how did she even get to paint this? I mean, what was the process? And it's frustrating. I mean, at this moment, at least, we don't know the answer to that uh, question, how that exactly worked. Um, but I think uh, for many unusual women in my period, women's sexuality was an obstacle to fashion being taken seriously as a professional. And the best example of that, or at least the best known example of that in my field is probably Artemisia Gentileschi, who uh, was the daughter of a painter, but received um, some art lessons from another uh, male painter named Agostino Tassi, who raped Artemisia Gentileschi. And I think for many of us who work on women artists in the period, it's really frustrating that Gentileschi, Artemisia, is a great artist, but it's really difficult to get people to talk about her work without linking um, aspects of her painting to the fact that she was a victim of sexual assault. Um, I once experimented actually in a class, an Italian Baroque class at TCU, and I tried not to say anything about um, Artemisia's uh, violent encounter with Agostino Tassi, but it was fruitless because a student raised their hand in the first five minutes and said, oh, Dr. Bone, wasn't Artemisia also raped by this other painter? I mean, so, you know, it sex sells um, and sex uh, in the 17th century was associated principally with women. And I think um, it gets in the way of a reputation. It got in the way of Artemisia, I think, being taken seriously as an artist for a long time. Uh, and, you know, nowadays, Artemisia Gentileschi is the best known uh, woman painter of, I would argue, of the 17th century in Europe. I mean, and, and she's becoming a familiar name. But why did it take so long? She really is a great painter. She's a follower of Caravaggio, and I would argue really comparable in quality 
to the works of Caravaggio, who's practically, you know, a household world word. Uh, so I think, um, you know, our, Artemisia had financial struggles throughout her career. She had a lot of um, challenges and difficulties for a variety of reasons. I think if she had been a male painter, uh, I mean, you know, she would have had a very different uh, experience because her skill and talent would have more readily um, superseded uh, whatever aspects of her personal life uh, might or might not have been pertinent to her artistic production. So, you no, know, I think also if I can just circle back to the uh, a point about writers and what gets written in history books. Um, one of my favorite quotations when I have taught about women artists to my students is to go all the way back to 1400, uh, the first, at least the first that we know of professional woman writer around 1400 wrote, um, how can women be taken seriously and credited for their accomplishments when men write all the history books? <laughs> And, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. She put it a little bit better. But I think it really is always important to think about how do we know what we know? Who is our information coming from? And how is that information colored by the voice that uh, provides it? So, um, Christine de That's That's, that's a, a really good point. Um, I hope many of you saw... Um, Artemisia's Judith and Holofernes that was recently at the, at the Kimball, actually in two exhibitions, one sort of face-to-face -face with Kehinde Wiley and then in the Capo de Monte um, exhibition, um, and, and that's the institution that houses that work. But uh, Babette, I did the, the, the same thing in the didactics. I thought, well, we, we do have to address the, the rape because everyone knows knows about it and how do you tell that and if you if you're a historian and you know you have the time you you look into it you you read this hugely long transcript of the trial and um, also the very good art history that's been written in recent years um, so many people have, have weighed in into the nuances and have pointed out that she really um, did not see herself as a victim. She moved very quickly on. It was a case of family honor. And it, it, it was, uh, she was highly ambitious and absolutely fascinating personality. I think um, because of her ambition and resolve, and pure energy, uh, she forged this career against against the odds, and and um, was not a not really afraid of of anything. Um, one of the recent discoveries, and that's why I laud the archival work that Babat and others do, was finding a series of letters that she had written to. Um, uh, a male lover uh, who was a man. So she, it was a bit of a role reversal in a way, absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, passionate. And so she lived life as she chose chose to live it. And, and uh, that's the sort of thing for which we can all take a bit of, of inspiration. She made mistakes too along the way, I would say. She didn't always make the best choices, but uh, don't. Uh, most of us don't. Um, so, so much for, for um, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, but she really does loom very large, you know, in the, uh, when we're, we think about uh, um, artists during that time. And uh, this whole issue of, of really power, um, it's, so, you know, in order to achieve a more inclusive and diverse community in the art world, that calls for some redistribution of power. 
Um, and those imbalances can run the gamut from just being unseen uh, or neglected to acts of co 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 um, coercion, harassment, or outright um, violence. And Andrew, I'm wondering if you could, could share your thoughts about how women artists can navigate an imbalance of power or find support for the work that they, that they do. Well, I think some of the same issues still exist. There are still, you know, moments of um, especially sexual, you know, either sexual assault or, um, you know, the whole Me Too movement was no stranger to female artists. Um, so some of those issues still exist. And um, one way that I think Another way that there's a power struggle, in a sense, we were talking about sexuality. Um, even many of the women included in Women Painting Women worked toward presenting a male erotic, uh, kind of a, 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 a male erotic nude for women, for heterosexual women. And this role reversal has never worked. So, you know, a lot of the women in the ex in my exhibition, and thank you, Babette, for saying that it was a good and important exhibition. Um, a lot of the women, especially from the 1970s and 80s, attempted to paint male nudes. And as a result of that, some of them, their career suffered, or they didn't get airplay, or their exhibitions got shut down. You can have naked women all day long, but put a naked man or, or male anatomy in a painting and it becomes a completely different issue. So that kind of thing still happens today. Women today still um, navigate a husband or a partner and children you know, in the mix with their own career. Often this happens. A lot of women painted right through having children, but they didn't have markets for all that time because they couldn't promote themselves in the proper way or get themselves out there. They kept doing what they wanted to do, but they were unable to, again, you know, get the airplay that their male counterparts had. And a lot of female artists have married male artists and guess whose career is the more considered the more important one or, you know, the more money making one within a relationship. It's usually the male artist. So some of these problems still really do exist. And I may have lost sight of your question, Nancy, because I was just sort of focused on the things Babs was saying and you said about history and how it's written and how it happens and the dynamics and just thinking about how that still exists today. Well, I think that, think that's a a good broad way to start wrapping up um, mm -hmm. our, our conversation and move on to um, some questions. But before we do that, is there anything else either of you would like to to add to the conversation? Well, I always have something to add. It's a <laughs> hazard as a professor, but. I would like to see more museums developing acquisitions like the marvelous recent acquisition that Nancy's been talking about, the uh, still life at the Kimball. I mean, there's still, I mean, as Andrea was saying, there's still a significant imbalance in price between the works of men and women. Uh, but there's also, uh, and it varies in some measure from museum to museum, but there are most museums, with few exceptions, have an inordinate imbalance in the number of works by male artists and the number of works they possess in their permanent collections by female artists. And I think it's hard to supersede that because it's been going on for so long that it would take obviously many years and um, a lot of money to start to seriously redress that imbalance. But for example, the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC just got a $10 million gift 
uh, to start the ball rolling to fund more acquisitions by women artists. And actually, I'm not even sure if that contributed, but they recently bought a painting by Lavinia Fontana. Uh, so maybe that was uh, part of that same uh, project. So I think museums are sensitive to this issue and are trying to do so, but I think it's really important, both because women are, let's face it, about half of them in race, but also there are some fabulous women artists out there. And I must say, I'm not a specialist in contemporary art, but there were extraordinary women artists in Andrea's show who I knew nothing about. And so it was really a revelation to see their works and think about uh, their interpretations of female figures. So exhibitions play a really important role too, but if you acquire a work, by a woman for your permanent uh, collection, you're really putting your money where your mouth is in terms of making a commitment to uh, both supporting living women artists and also um, unveiling the accomplishments of uh, both the living and the dead. And I would add to that, um, just echoing what Babette is saying, again, you know, acquiring a work impacts that artist market in a positive way. Yeah. And so institutions really have that responsibility. And we're looking closely at that here at The Modern. Um, I have to say more so, we're looking more so at artists of color uh, than just women artists, because we do, compared to the artists of color, we have a lot of women artist. We don't have a lot of either is the reality of it, you know, so we're, we're looking at all of that. And as Babette said, there's, there's no quick fix for this, you cannot correct this problem. In even a decade, you know, it's gonna, it's, it will take time. But what museums can do is commit to changing the numbers, whatever that means, you know, presenting a certain percentage of women artists, for example, uh, to the acquisition committee every time. I mean, you know, I don't know. There are ways, you know, uh, dedicating a certain amount of money, but it has to be enough. It can't be just a little money. Um, it can't be like a token gesture. So, you know, we're we're talking about all of that internally, as I'm sure a lot of museums across the country and across the globe are doing now. Wonderful. Um, well, I see we do have some, some questions, and here's one from Deborah uh, Harrow, um, who says she's going to read up on Lavinia Fontana <laughs> next. Uh, and do you know a scholarly source um, for exploration? So we know there's an exhibition catalog to look forward to, but in the meantime, Babette, right. um, any, well, any recommendations? Sure. Thank you for that. But definitely look for uh, the exhibition catalog from Dublin um, starting in May of, uh, of this summer. Um, I uh, am at the moment the most recent person to publish on Lavinia Fontana, my book on uh, women artists, their patrons and their publics in early modern Bologna, which was published last year. But I would say it's quite a bit older, but one of my... Uh, favorite books on Lavinia Fontana that I can also recommend that was published uh, about 20 years ago is by uh, an art historian named Carolyn Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-Y. And she wrote a really sensitive uh, and interesting uh, book on Lavinia Fontana. So I would also recommend that. It's in the TCU library, but it's long since out of print. So if you don't find it in the library, you might have trouble tracking it down. And, and speaking of exhibitions and, and coming into the canon and name recognition, I, uh, there, there are, I'll just mention a couple of other artists who are having their time. Uh, Rosa Bonheur, a 19th century animal painter who was very popular in her day, sort of, you know, was forgotten a bit as having an exhibition right now at the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, there's a fascinating artist, Michelina uh, Wattier, 
who is from the southern Netherlands. She's a contemporary of Louise Moyon and a wonderful uh, figure painter um, who had a show in Antwerp several years ago. And um, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, is just doing a small focus exhibition on her. And uh, I know um, myself and fellow museum curators are, are ears and eyes were perking up when we saw her work because this is an artist no one really knew about. Um, Camille Claudel um, uh, is receiving more attention. There was a museum uh, in France dedicated to her work, so partner of, of um, Rodin, um, uh, who, who is a fine artist. There's a recent acquisition, beautiful, by the um, um, Art Institute of Chicago, a robust of her, her work. Um, another question, how are people who are writing what will become tomorrow's history do better in terms of empowering women artists? For either of you. Babette, you're doing your job, so. And as, as are, are you, Andrea. So I think more of the same, you know, with, uh, exhibition catalogs are a, a, a wonderful um, way, I think, of trying to to redress certain things, bring out certain points, and so on. It's tricky with my area in particular because women do not always want to be contextualized by their gender, so. Right. Even That's in doing point. women painting women, um, you know, I knew that it would be problematic in this way. And I actually had conversations with all of the artists included in the exhibition, uh, all who are living, to make sure, which most of them are, to make sure they were good with being in an exhibition like this. And they were. And the reason they were is because they know that it was, they felt that it would bring exposure in a good way to the notion of diversity and the idea that women as women and women as subjects has broadened so much historically over time. But I think if we're talking about a contemporary artist or even a 20th century, you know, modern to contemporary, the way to do that is just to write about the work, <laughs> just write about the work in history, you know, not not just because the person is a woman, but just because the person is a, a great artist. Yeah. It's ha having that air play, as you put it, yeah. one way or another is just important, those conversations. Um, I have a question from um, Kelly. Ward, uh, what if the panelists think of male counterparts or male artists and their support for their female contemporaries, uh, such as Christo with his wife, or perhaps uh, Alfred Stieglitz with George O'Keefe? I find this to be progressive and necessary for the roles of marginalized groups of women. I, I, I'll I just chime in and say, um, I, I don't know how progressive it is, but it's um, because I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, women often, if they're married to another artist, the woman's career takes the, the passenger seat, not the driver's seat. That still happens regularly. So what would be really progressive <laughs> would be for the opposite to happen, for a, a man to let, you know, his partner, I'm not saying this never happens, but um, have more of the limelight in terms of career. And I think because women often are mothers and the sort of keeper of homes and that still is in play, at play, you know, the career can suffer a little bit. Um, there are plenty of examples too, though, where two artists are married and you've never heard of the male artist. Maybe you've only heard of the female artist. So I think that happens in all kinds of ways. I don't think that women should depend on a man to boost their career. 
basically. Maybe that's true in any vocation, right? Yes. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I will say in fairness, though, with the Lavinia Fontana painting behind me, her husband was a house husband. There's a mm. reason she remained so productive professionally with 11 children. Her husband uh, took care of a lot of the behind the scenes stuff for her because she was uh, earning a good living as a painter. Uh, so there are exceptions, but Christo and his wife, I mean, I hear that and I think, well, whose name do we associate with those productions? I mean, it, what's his wife's name? I mean, how, how many of us can come up with that? So I agree with Andrew that I think those partnerships more often than not probably don't really serve uh, the woman artist as well uh, as the man artist, with with exceptions like Lavinia and I'm sure quite a few others, but um, it's uh, there are a lot of disadvantages in those partnerships for women. So, sometimes going going outside th th that kind of coupling or par partnership, just having a wide body of fellow um, fellow artists who support each other can be important as well. Whether that formed in school, I'm thinking of. Kendi Wiley and and you know referencing the artists he knows and respects like um, uh, um, and he'll mention female artists and so on like Nicolene Tongs. So. And by the way, Andrea did another wonderful exhibition also a few years back on Kehinde Wiley that was just really fantastic. We also have a new acquisition that's just come on view this week. So <laughs> of, of a, a Wiley painting and two sculptures. So oh, wow. amazing. The painting oh. is not a direct reference. It's one of the few that doesn't directly reference, but it references all the tropes of the past, but not a specific artist. So yeah, it's pretty beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. What's the subject, Andrea? Well, one is just, it's a man uh, with like a wallpaper background. And then the two sculptures are both sculptures that Kehinde made during the pandemic. So they are actually people he knows, which is unusual for him. Yeah. They were his trainers in Dakar where he stayed during the pandemic. So he made these beautiful, very noble busts of the two of them. And yeah, they're, they're pretty stunning to see. Yes. And before we close, I, we may have addressed this last question. Is there still an opportunity for women artists from the Renaissance to receive recognition they deserve? And do you imagine that any will become household names in, in the future? And, uh, you know, I think it, uh, uh, I cited um, Michalina uh, Wautier as, as an example of very talented artists. Household names that's hard to achieve, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> very hard to achieve. And I, I do want to say there simply were fewer women artists during the Renaissance. So um, it's, it's not that they were all hidden away. They may have been practicing different types of art, like need, needlework and so on, um, rather than, than, than painting, which was privileged. Um, but, uh, but I do think on the, I, I mean, I, can't disagree with anything Nancy is saying, but I think on the other hand, um, a lot of people, not just myself, are working on women artists from the Renaissance. And as more people work on this, and as more museums acquire mm -hmm. works by women artists, and as more uh, museums and galleries uh, promote exhibitions on women artists, I think it's inevitable that they will become better known and some will become uh, famous. I don't know how to, I'm the wrong person to assess household words because all of my household words, you know, <laughs> probably anybody else's to be honest. Uh, so I'm not sure how to respond to that bit, but I do think uh, that women artists will uh, become more and more uh, well known as time goes on. I, they certainly deserve to. Mm -hmm. So, 
hear, hear, art historians of the future. <laughs> well, I, I've really enjoyed talking with both of you, and um, it was really an insightful, inspiring uh, hour. Uh, so thank you, um, Andrea Carnes and Babat Bone, for sharing your thoughts, your expertise. Thank you to TCU Magazine and to the TCU Alumni Association. And many thanks to our audience for listening and for posing your questions. Yeah. Uh, to keep up to date on the happenings at TCU and among the Frog family, uh, go to uh, uh, magazine dot tcu dot edu uh, or get on horned frogs connect and uh thanks again for joining us today thank you